Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Open relationships, good or bad? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Working on all fours, installing 4x4 ceramic tiles in a 10x12 kitchen was hard work. Ronnie Jackson carefully applied adhesive to the next tile, then aligned it with the previous one. The tile stood up as it should, and he nodded with satisfaction. A deviation of a couple of millimeters here, a couple of millimeters there, can lead to the failure of the project. And because Echo's renovation and remodeling had a 100% satisfaction guaranteed policy, Ronnie made sure every tile was installed exactly before moving forward. As if sensing that he had reached the end of the row, Charlotte, Ronnie's wife, called Echo's renovation and remodeling on Ronnie's phone. Ronnie answered the call. Ronnie, it's me, Charlotte said irritably. Aha, uh -huh, Ronnie replied, already reaching for the box of tiles to start the next row. There was a time when Ronnie would answer the phone and his wife would giggle and say hello, honey. Ronnie couldn't remember the last time she said hi, honey. What are you going to finish? Charlotte snapped. I'm in Pritchard's kitchen, Ronnie replied, looking at the nearly eight feet he had finished. HM, this will take me about three hours, give or take, I think. Okay, Charlotte snapped and ended the conversation. Ronnie wanted to hurry up. He had a strong desire to cut this work short, but he forced himself to move slowly and methodically. But even as his hands did their work, his mind thought of his wife with whom he had lived for 21, almost 22 years. Ronnie met Charlotte Eccles on his second day of work at Eccles Renovation and Remodeling. Charlotte walked into John Eek's office, apologizing for her poor performance at John W. Dawson High School. Escaping her lips, she was a portly brunette with long wavy hair and patches of large pimples. Ronnie looked at the two basketball-sized buttocks poking out of her denim cutoffs, then returned his attention to the selection of hand tools in John's tool shed. That's my daughter, John growled at Ronnie. Understood, sir. My daughter, yes, sir, Ronnie said, fighting the urge to shrug indifferently. Somehow sensing that her father did not want her to interact with his new employee, Charlotte made it a habit to smile flirtatiously and say hello to Ronnie whenever their paths crossed. For his part, Ronnie was always polite to the girl but did not encourage her attention. What did I tell you, huh? J.N. growled at Ronnie. No need to chase after my daughter, okay, sir. I'm not chasing your daughter, Ronnie said honestly. The truth was that 21-year-old Ronnie found 17-year-old Charlotte Rare Eccles nothing more than a nuisance. She was at least 50 pounds overweight, had terrible acne, and there was something particularly repulsive about her. Ronnie also found Charlotte to be quite immature. Hey, Ronnie, Charlotte said coyly one day as Ronnie and another Eccles employee were unloading their equipment after a long day. Ahu, Ronnie said, struggling with an unopened bag of quick-drying cement. Listen. I turn 18 on Saturday. Charlotte leaned forward, giving Ronnie an unobstructed view of the front of her blouse. That's nice, Ronnie said. Well, happy birthday, another employee smiled. So, Ronnie, what are you getting me for my birthday? Charlotte asked. Hmm, close your eyes, Ronnie suggested, managing to drag his bag to the back door of the pickup. Okay, Charlotte giggled. What do you see? Ronnie asked, throwing his bag into the car. Ah, uh, nothing, said Charlotte. This is my gift. Happy birthday, Ronnie said and dragged the bag of cement towards the barn. But Lois Eccles forced John Eccles to invite Ronnie Jackson to their home for Charlotte's birthday party. A pill store in Dolans, Utah, sold Ronnie a beautiful birthday card, and a pawn shop in Fairway, Utah, sold Ronnie a beautiful silver bracelet for $20. Lois forced John to ask Ronnie to escort Charlotte to the prom. Ronnie actually accompanied Charlotte, wincing at the sight of her in a tight, sleeveless dress. However, Ronnie was very kind. He posed for photos, danced with Charlotte, then took her home and kissed her goodnight. A few days later, John growled at Ronnie that Charlotte was heartbroken because Ronnie hadn't called her. Ronnie pursed his lips but still called Charlotte and asked her out. That date led to another date. On the fifth date, Charlotte gave Ronnie her virginity.
Tracy Lois Jackson was born five months after their wedding, and for the next ten years, Ronnie Jackson was given the crappiest job Eccles renovations and remodeling had. Ronnie was sure that on some of these jobs, John Eccles went out of his way to make sure Eccles' renovation and remodeling got the job just so he could turn around and foist this backbreaking job on his son-in-law. For the first 16 years of their marriage, Charlotte Jackson was a good wife. She really made an effort to know her husband's likes and dislikes. She actually learned how to cook his favorite dishes. She really learned to be quiet on Sundays when the Denver Broncos were on TV. Charlotte Jackson also managed to lose 30 pounds, then she gained them back. Then she would lose 10 to 20 pounds only to gain it back plus another 30 or 40 pounds. Harlata's skin did improve a bit, but she always had acne scars on her cheeks. Cosmetics did reduce the severity of the scarring, but it was always visible. When Tracy went to Grover Cleveland Elementary School, Charlotte was hired by the Garland County Public Library. The pay was minimal at best, but the benefits were enormous. Health insurance and dental insurance were well worth the low salary. Then, just after they celebrated their 16th year of marriage, Charlotte's cousin Darlene moved back to Dolan's, Utah. God knows where Darlene was dragging husband number three or four along with her. Darlene was loud, brash, obscene, and Gary, her husband, wasn't much better. To make matters worse, Gary was a Dallas Cowboys fan. Darlene was not a very good influence on her cousin. Charlotte became loud, brash, and complaining. She began to neglect household responsibilities, including cooking. Ronnie didn't mind, he was a good cook. He was no stranger to cleaning a pan or two pans, but the occasional slack suddenly became almost every evening when Charlotte, Darlene, and Gary found something to do outside the Jackson house. Tracy also learned to clean, cook, and sew buttons on her school uniform. But somehow it seemed that Tracy was resentful of her father rather than her mother for her mother's neglectful behavior. Ronnie timed his work almost perfectly. Three hours after Charlotte's phone call, he finished the threshold at the entrance from the kitchen to the living room. He slowly stood up and straightened his back with difficulty. Good God, I'm getting too old for this, Ronnie thought as he collected his tools and the few remaining tiles after leaving the Pritchard house. Ronnie called John Eccles. He still winced whenever he heard the man's slurred speech. The blow nearly killed the large man, and his recovery was slow. John suffered a massive stroke minutes after his wife Lois revealed she had chest cancer. Thus, even after a double mastectomy and undergoing radiation, Lois was burdened with caring for her husband. Dennis Eccles, Brian Eccles, and Paul Eccles did everything they could to help. Ronnie also helped care for John Eccles when needed. Charlotte Eccles, the only girl in the family, was her mother's constant companion. It was Charlotte who drove her mother to Fairway Hospital and held her mother's hand as she sobbed weakly in pain. Lois lost the fight, succumbing to illness. John also seemed to have lost the will to live, but death didn't seem to want to take Jonathan Dennis Eccles just yet. So day after day, John was wheeled into the office on a gurney. Day after day, John sat at his desk and cursed his useless left hand as he tried to type on his computer keyboard. Then, at the end of the day, Dennis, Brian, or Paul would drive John home. Yes, sir, I'm leaving Pritchard's job now. It's finished, Ronnie said as John grunted, barked, and wheezed into the phone. At home, Ronnie sniffed the air with pleasure. Pork chops, mashed potatoes, and French-cut green beans were one of his favorite foods. After John's debilitating stroke, Charlotte switched the Jackson family to a heart-healthy diet. The diet helped Charlotte lose 40 pounds but she was still quite overweight. Ronnie accused Tracy of leaving home and going to Brigham Young University just to avoid the tasteless food Charlotte fed them, and Tracy did not deny this fact. Ronnie leaned over to kiss his wife as she busied herself at the stove. She waved him off and pinched her nostrils, throwing his clothes into the hamper. Ronnie washed the sweat from his stiff, aching body. This work was grueling enough when he was a young man of 21, now. At 43 years old, this was at the limit of his capabilities and certainly did not add to his health. But Dennis, Brian, and Paul were not going to pay attention to this, and with the mounting medical bills associated with John Eccles' rehabilitation, Dennis, Brian, and Paul said there was no money in the budget to hire anyone to help. 
Drying himself with a towel, Ronnie ignored the handsome, muscular man in the foggy mirror. Ronnie was wearing a t-shirt and shorts. He then came downstairs just as Charlotte was placing his plate in front of his chair. And for dessert, there's hot apple pie, Charlotte announced, placing a frosted mug and a can of beer in front of him. Oh my god, Ronnie said, even as a lump of bile formed in his stomach. Ronnie remembered the last time Charlotte poured him a glass of frosted beer. At that time, he was smiling, enjoying the refreshing drink on her 35th birthday, a few months before their 17th anniversary. While Tracy was out with friends, Charlotte poured Ronnie a beer in a frosted mug. Ronnie took a sip of the ice-cold drink, enjoying the taste. Then Charlotte said, Darling, there is something I need to talk to you about. Many words followed about nothing as Ronnie continued to look at his wife without saying a word. Finally, Ronnie said, Of course, I wish you would just get to the point. This beer is almost gone. Charlotte glared at Ronnie, then said that Darlene and Gary weren't exclusive, they had an open marriage. Charlotte then asked Ronnie if he had ever thought about intim with other women. Certainly, I am a man. Of course, I was looking at that girl Shelly at the gas station, Ronnie admitted. Shelly at the gas station? Yeah, exactly, as if you'd ever have a chance with her, Charlotte snorted. But I'm married, Ronnie continued. So yeah, I look, yeah, I think about it, and then it all stops right there. But did you think it wouldn't stop right there? Charlotte continued. Did you assume that you could go ahead and do what you wanted? You could do this and then go home without thinking about the consequences? But I can't do it, Charlotte, Ronnie said. We are married. We took vows. We took these vows in front of all our family and friends. He drained his mug and rose to his feet. He took the mug to the sink and washed it. We swore to be faithful to each other. We swore to leave everyone else, and even that girl Shelly at the gas station, Ronnie said. But we could make new vows, Charlotte suggested. No new vows, Ronnie said decisively, putting the washed glass away in the closet. These old vows work just fine. Both Darlene and Gary may be in an open marriage, but we are not. We are not and never will be in an open marriage. But, said Charlotte. No buts. End of discussion, said Ronnie, leaving the kitchen. Ronnie hoped that this would be the end of it, but it didn't happen. Twice more, Charlotte brought up the idea of an open marriage, and twice more Ronnie said no. But honey, Charlotte whined. It would simply be a confirmation of our love for each other. We love each other enough to allow each other to do this because we trust each other. Holy mother, do you even hear the complete and utter nonsense you are trying to spew, said Ronnie. No, Charlotte. If you need me to let you cheat on me like your cousin did to show you that I love you, then I guess I don't love you. The fourth time Charlotte started talking about opening up their marriage, Ronnie called her father. Charlotte sat watching as the cell phone rang. Hello John, how are you, said Ronnie. Charlotte's face paled as she realized Ronnie was talking to her father. Then, to make matters worse, Ronnie asked to speak to Lois. Hey Lois, listen, Charlotte wants to tell you something, Ronnie said. Here, Charlotte, tell your mother what interesting thoughts Darlene fed you. Charlotte took the cell phone from Ronnie's outstretched hand. She then tried to get up from the kitchen table. Ronnie had anticipated this move and held Charlotte in place with a heavy hand. Trapped, Charlotte talked about complete nonsense and finally ended the conversation. You son of a, Charlotte growled at Ronnie with hatred. Listen, Charlotte, and listen carefully, Ronnie hissed. Bring up this nonsense about an open marriage one more time, and you'll have no marriage to open. We will just get divorced. Charlotte didn't bring up the topic again. Ronnie was relieved, and his persistence also seemed to cool Darlene and Gary's attempts to communicate with Ronnie. The toxic twins, as Ronnie dubbed them, stopped appearing in the house as often. Now, five years later, Ronnie watched his wife pour him a glass of beer. He watched as the foam almost reached the top of the mug. Charlotte wasn't very good at pouring beer. You know, I turn 40 next Tuesday, Charlotte began as Ronnie chewed his first bite of pork chop. Yes, Ronnie said, swallowing. And I was a virgin when we met, Charlotte continued. I'm not sure how those two facts fit together, but okay. 
You're turning 40, and you are a virgin, Ronnie said, taking a second bite of his pork chop. I mean 40, the big four, said Charlotte. And during all this time, what, I only had one man. Luckily for you, that man was me, Ronnie said. Did you use bon and green beans? Charlotte asked. But you, you had what, at least ten women, asked Charlotte. I mean, is that fair? Life isn't always fair, Ronnie said, sipping his beer. So I was thinking, since my birthday is coming up, I mean, big four, and after taking care of you and Tracy and my mom and dad all this time, I deserve to. You know, let my hair down a little, take a walk. So Darlene and I are going to Las Vegas next week, she got them a great deal for a week at one of the casinos, Charlotte said. Ronnie continued to eat. He swallowed his bite, then washed it down with another sip of beer. And while we're there, we, ah, uh, we could, you know. Meet a couple of guys, Charlotte insisted. I mean, not necessarily for a night, but just for a date. Just, you know, just for a date. Just let me experience what another man is like, make me appreciate what I have at home even more, you know? The sauce is almost perfect, Ronnie said. So what do you think, asked Charlotte. I told you, the sauce is almost perfect, Ronnie said. No, Ronnie, this, this is for me, you know? I want to spread my wings, gain experience, Charlotte snapped. You mean cheat on me? Ronnie asked. Listen, I've already decided everything, Charlotte snapped. So you can either let me do this or get a divorce. Okay, I'll file for divorce, Ronnie agreed. Do you have any ice cream to go with this pie? Wait, what? Ronnie asked. You know how expensive divorce is. You can't even talk about it, Charlotte gasped, stunned. What is there to talk about? You just sitting right there told me that you had already decided everything. You and your shabby cousin are going to Vegas. You're not asking me this, you've already decided that you're going to Vegas. Screw the mountain of bills we have here, you're going to Las Vegas to celebrate the big four. And while you're there, you might have a date. Even if you are a married woman, you can have a date. Then you're telling me I can either go along with this plan of yours or get a divorce, Ronnie said, pushing his empty plate away. This pie, does it come with any ice cream? But it's only for one week, said Charlotte. One week, one day, one minute, it doesn't matter, Ronnie said, cutting himself a piece of pie. Cheating is cheating, and I refuse to be married to a cheater. So no ice cream. You can take Darlene, Charlotte suggested. Oh God, no, Ronnie laughed. Dear God, Charlotte, I wouldn't have a night with Darlene if she were the last woman on earth. Ronnie blew on a piece of pie, then popped it into his mouth. He screwed up his face in disgust. Oh great, just wonderful, you used that aspartame crap, didn't you? Ronnie asked, pushing his plate away. Ronnie rose to his feet, wiping his mouth with a napkin, and walked out of the kitchen. Don't worry, tomorrow I'll meet with a lawyer and start this divorce, Ronnie said, heading up the stairs. Pritchard's work was completed, and Dennis had no plans to do anything else until he received permission to begin rebuilding the federal savings and loan, but Ronnie. Charlotte exclaimed, you don't even listen to me. Of course, Ronnie shouted, walking down the stairs. You didn't listen to me. I told you what will happen if you bring this up again. We'll get divorced. Well, you brought it up again, so we're getting a divorce. In the third bedroom, which they designated as a home office, Ronnie turned on the computer. It was seven years old, outdated but still working and connected to the internet. Having typed a query into a search engine, Ronnie began searching for lawyers. He saw that Penny Barnes had an online form, and he filled it out. A moment later, a call alerted him that he had an appointment with Penny Barnes at 10 the next morning. After tidying up the kitchen, Charlotte went up the stairs. She undressed and climbed into bed without clothes. Ronnie was almost surprised when Charlotte pressed her flabby body against him. No thanks, Ronnie said, and rolled away from Charlotte. Good night. Ronnie woke up at the usual time, half past five in the morning. He didn't have to go to work, but he still woke up at his usual time. He quickly slipped out of bed and closed their bedroom door. He went downstairs and made coffee, then used his cell phone to check his email. 
Penny Barnes' office sent him an email outlining what he needed to bring to the meeting. At 7, Ronnie was arguing with himself about whether to drink a second cup of coffee. He heard Charlotte stomping around upstairs and decided to do nothing for her. If she wanted a cup, she could make her own coffee. No, no, I told him, give it to me, or Charlotte was talking on her cell phone as she walked down the stairs. She screamed when she saw Ronnie sitting at the table, calm, reading the news on his cell phone. She interrupted the phone conversation and put the cell phone in her robe pocket. Ronnie, what are you doing here? asked Charlotte. I told you, Dennis hasn't gotten permission to start rebuilding the federal savings and loan yet, so I have nothing to do today, Ronnie shrugged. Right now, the grass is too wet to cut, so I read today's news. Did you know that Burns and Burns is thinking about opening a second store? This one will be right there in Pansky. You could have left me some coffee, Charlotte snapped. Ask Darlene to make you something, Ronnie said, putting his cup in the sink. Penny Barnes was an attractive brunette. Ronnie suspected that her glasses were only on to make her look smarter and more serious. Hmm, Penny said, looking at their financial statements. Did you just refinance your home at 3.9%? My daughter is in her last year, Ronnie said, and the father-in-law had a ton of medical bills, and the mother-in-law's medical bills were minimally covered. They both had deductibles that were just unrealistic. Then funeral expenses. Then Eccles was on the verge of bankruptcy. A couple of jobs went over budget because Paul didn't seem to remember to time the orders correctly. Yeah, Penny agreed, continuing to read. So, Mr. Jackson, when you divorce your employer's daughter, how will that affect your job? I think I'll end things with him, Ronnie said, and a smile touched his lips. But Mrs. Jackson's job at the Garland County Public Library shouldn't be affected, Penny mused. As of Friday, Dennis still had not received approval to begin renovating the federal savings and loan. So Ronnie was at home finishing up some renovations at the Jackson house when Charlotte called. What is it? What kind of scam? Charlotte screamed as Ronnie answered. Oh good, you have documents, Ronnie said. So what's wrong with the bathroom on the first floor? You said something needs to be fixed, but I'll be damned if I can tell you what's wrong. The lock is jamming, said Charlotte. You and me, we'll have to talk when I get home. No, we've already talked. Talking doesn't seem to do any good as long as you want to listen to Darlene and not your husband. So no, the time for talking is over, Ronnie said. Yes, I see what the matter is. Okay, I understand. Bye, but I don't want a divorce, Charlotte whined. And I don't want to be married to a brainless cheater, Ronnie said. Anything else? No, goodbye then, Ronnie ignored Charlotte's next call. When John's phone number came up, Ronnie put down the screwdriver and picked up the phone. Hello, said Ronnie. John barked, grunted, and moped. Ronnie was truly amazed at how many swear words he could understand when his father-in-law demanded to know what was going on between Ronnie and Charlotte. Quite simple, actually, sir, Ronnie said. Darlene and her husband seemed to have an open marriage. And they convinced Charlotte that she should have an open marriage too, you know. Where they can run around and have intimate with whoever they want and somehow still stay married. Well, I told Charlotte that I had no desire to have an open marriage. Jayan grunted, squeaked, and mumbled his way through another outburst of anger. Ronnie shook his head as if John could see the gesture. Well, last night your daughter said I could either go along with it or get a divorce. So I'm getting a divorce, Ronnie said. John tried to argue with Ronnie again. The man even resorted to emotional blackmail. Well, sir, I appreciate it. I really do, Ronnie lied. But you have three sons and a daughter, you really should leave this matter to them, sir, and not to me. Plus, why the hell would I want a company that has been in the red for the last three years? Ronnie said to himself. Charlotte brought reinforcements with her when she returned home. Ronnie saw this coming and sat quietly while Darlene and Gary made their point. So, you see, Ronnie, since our marriage is not threatened by other men, Gary said with a smug look on his face, Darlene is free to have friendships outside of marriage. Hey, I mean, as long as I know she'll come home to me, you know? And of course, I share all my experiences with him, Darlene said. There are no secrets between us. It really opened our hearts, our lives, 
to each other. Oh well, that certainly clears things up, Ronnie said, and Charlotte, Darlene, and Gary smiled. No, Ronnie said and got up from the couch. But hey, Charlotte, after we get divorced, you can open your heart, your life, and the doors to your inner world to anyone you want. Oh, what do I see? Gary grinned. So just because you feel inadequate, Charlotte should close the door on her own capabilities and needs? Ronnie flashed a smile that showed all his teeth. He walked to the living room door and turned toward the stairs. If you need to think that way to feel better, by all means, keep thinking that way, Ronnie said and left the room. Again, that night, Charlotte tried to initiate into him. Sleep, Charlotte, tomorrow is a busy day for you, isn't it? Ronnie grinned. As usual, Ronnie woke up at half past five and got out of bed. He no longer bothered to close their bedroom door, not caring whether his early rise would wake his wife or not. Going downstairs, he made himself some coffee and sat sipping coffee and reading the news on his phone. The national news made him snort in disgust. At eleven in the morning, Gary knocked on the door, Ronnie opened the door, and Gary tried to enter the house. Ronnie's heavy hand stopped the grinning advance. Yes? Ronnie asked. Hey, I, I am here to pick up Charlotte and take them to the airport, Gary said, trying to force his way into the house again. I'll let her know you're here, Ronnie said and pushed Gary back. He then closed the door and went back to watching his pre-recorded sitcom. A few moments later, Charlotte thundered down the stairs, dragging her suitcase. Why didn't you let me know that Gary and Darlene were waiting for me outside, she demanded from Ronnie. H.M.? Oh yeah, Gary and Darlene are here, Ronnie said, turning his attention back to his program. God, really? Do you have to be so childish about all this? Charlotte squealed. She set down her suitcase and leaned towards Ronnie. He pulled away from her, so she ended up kissing the empty space. We'll talk about this when I get back, said Charlotte. No, we won't do this. We really won't do that, Ronnie said. After his sitcom and a hearty meal, Ronnie completed the last of his chores by painting the front door of the house. He chose pale yellow, and the color contrasted nicely with the red brick facade of the house. He grinned when their cat Samson meowed in annoyance from the garage. The animal had food, water, and a clean litter tray in the garage, so he had nothing to ask for. As soon as the door is dry, buddy, I'll let you out of there, Ronnie promised the beast. Back upstairs, Ronnie logged in and cancelled their joint credit cards. He didn't know about any credit cards his wife had in her name and had no desire to look, but he had no intention of funding his wife's infidelity or her cousin's extravagance. He logged into Charlotte's personal bank account and withdrew half of the balance. He also went into their joint account, of which he was the only contributor, and withdrew half. The bank's website helped him open a new account in his name only, and he transferred the money withdrawn from other accounts to his new account. Again, online accounts made it easy to remove his name from utilities and cable TV. He shrugged when the Garland County Power and Light Company sent him an email informing him that his cancellation order would not take effect until the end of the billing cycle. I don't care, Ronnie said to the computer screen. Let's go to Sloan's Pizza, Ronnie said to himself as his stomach growled. Of course, since Charlotte wouldn't let me eat there, hell, I guess I'll probably drop dead of a heart attack right there. Hmm, let's check, Ronnie ordered pizza and a glass of draft beer. He actually flirted with the waitress, even though the girl was almost 75 pounds overweight. The young woman smiled and tapped his wedding ring with her three-inch fingernail. Ronnie looked at the ring, and his good mood evaporated. He thanked the woman and left her a $5 tip. In his truck, Ronnie tugged at the ring for a long time and sighed with relief when it finally came off. He tossed it into the cup holder on the console and looked at his hand. I'll love you forever, right Charlotte? Ronnie asked out loud. Well, I guess forever ended this morning. His truck made a soft squeaking sound, and Ronnie saw that his gas tank was almost empty. He stopped at a gas station and stuck the gun in the tank. He was about to fill up with ten dollars, but then he decided to fill the tank full. He pressed the right buttons and waited. Damn, twenty-two gallons takes a while, huh? Ronnie asked the pump, which kept gurgling and gurgling. He went to a nearby convenience store and found Budweiser beer. 
As Ronnie walked past another row of refrigerators, he saw containers of ice cream. He grabbed a pint of strawberry ice cream and carried both to the counter. Shelly no longer worked at the gas station. She got married. Breaking Ronnie's heart and the hearts of many other men who stopped at that particular gas station just because of the blonde beauty standing behind the counter. But Shannon Carlyle, the short brunette who now worked there, was almost as pretty as Shelly. Ronnie smiled as Shannon jumped onto the milk crate she had placed in front of the cash register. One day, he asked her how tall she was, and Shannon looked at him intently. I'm four feet eight inches tall, snapped the 19-year-old girl. How short are you? Ronnie joked. Um, about seven inches, Shannon said. Her brown eyes opened wide, then the girl laughed a deep, lively laugh that made her pretty face light up. Hmm, has your wife left town, shorty? Shannon concluded, looking at the purchase. My wife left. Completely. Period, Ronnie said. Shannon's dark brown eyes flickered to Ronnie's left hand, her eyes flickered up and met Ronnie's. She studied his face for a few moments. So, baby, where are you taking me on our first date? She asked brazenly, combing her thick brown hair back with her hand. Shannon, as pretty as you are, what on earth do you want with an old fart like me? Ronnie asked. Um, that's about seven inches, Shannon said and put Ronnie's purchases in the bag. Charlotte's 40th birthday was Tuesday. On Wednesday, Tracy, Ronnie, and Charlotte's daughter called Ronnie on his cell phone. Eccles renovation and remodeling, Ronnie answered. Dad, it was mom's birthday yesterday, Tracy said. Meacham, Ronnie asked, scratching his three-day stubble. Why didn't you call her? Tracy squealed. I didn't want this, Ronnie said. I didn't want to, Dad. Ah, uh, I guess you'll find out soon enough, Ronnie said. Your mother has decided that since she is now 40, she should go out and have intimate with other men. And what? Tracy asked. And what? Jesus Christ, what do they teach you in this school? Ronnie asked. She is married, and married women don't have a night with men they're not married to. Oh my God, this is so old-fashioned, Tracy chuckled. Goodbye, Tracy, Ronnie said, ending the conversation. Ten minutes later, his cell phone rang again, even though he saw that it was Charlotte's cell phone. Ronnie answered the call. Eccles renovation and remodeling, Ronnie says, automatically. Hi, Ronnie, Charlotte said in a firm voice. Hello. How do you like being a 40-year-old? Ronnie asked. It's not funny, Charlotte snapped. Well, I don't think it's funny either, Ronnie agreed. Oh. And thank you so much for canceling the credit cards, Charlotte continued. You're welcome, said Ronnie. Anything else? My birthday was yesterday, Ronnie said. Charlotte, why didn't you call? I didn't want to, but hey, maybe whoever you're having fun with will want to wish you a happy birthday, huh? Ronnie asked. Oh my god, grow up, Ronnie, Charlotte snapped. Already, Charlotte? What about adults? They fulfill their obligations, they respect their vows, Ronnie said. So, Melissa Sick, who asked Charlotte? Melissa C. Her name used to be Melissa Strom, do you remember her? The pretty little blonde who went to school with Tracy. She married Lucy C.I.C., the bank manager. Be that as it may, she now works at Gold Standard Real Estate, and I've got this cute little red head. Dear God, she's as cute as a pin. I tell you. But anyway, the good news is that she thinks she can find us a buyer for our house, real quick, Ronnie said. Buyer, Ronnie? We are not selling the house, Charlotte shouted into the phone. Oh, do you really think you can afford to ransom me? Remember, we need to pay off the second mortgage, and that's what Melissa told me. She can find us a buyer, but we'll probably have to bring cash to the table to pay off that mortgage, Ronnie said. We're not selling the house, Charlotte shouted again. And I put all your furniture in that easy warehouse on Independence Road, right next to Chevrolet Place, Ronnie continued. Block number 212. Your father has the key. Oh God, Darlene, I need to go home, Ronnie heard Charlotte make a sound. But your father couldn't pick up Samson, so I took him to Dennis, Ronnie continued. 
Dennis, Ronnie? My God, Dennis has those Dobermans, Charlotte screamed in horror. Hmm, oh damn, that's right. I didn't think about that, Ronnie grinned. No wonder he said he would be happy to adopt this cat. Well, Ronnie hung up, ignoring his wife's cries and pleas. Leaving the phone on the kitchen table, he went upstairs and accessed the internet. He heard his cell phone ring but ignored it. And maybe your mom's new boyfriend can pay for his last year of school, young lady, Ronnie muttered. Hey, why don't you see if you have a scholarship there for students who have a GPA of 2 and 1? Because after all, with that kind of attitude, it's hard to expect your father to pay for your education, Ronnie snapped, turning off the computer. Ronnie went into the bathroom and soaked his face, scraping off three days of stubble was hard and painful work, but he managed to do it without cutting himself. He took a hot shower, dried himself off, and put on jeans and a t-shirt. The computer was located in the cab of the pickup truck, behind the passenger seat. His last act was to throw his cell phone in the trash. Ronnie then rolled the trash can to the curb. I'll miss you, said Herman Vogel, a neighbor across the street when he met Ronnie on the side of the road. Vogel, there's no way in hell you'll do this, Ronnie laughed, shaking the man's hand. The only time we said more than two words to each other was when you complained about Tracy's boys playing their music too loud. And do you know how hard it is to get your neighbors to leave you alone, damn it? Said Herman, you were the perfect neighbor. Never borrowed my, never expected me to feed your cat, never asked me to pick up your mail or newspapers when you went on vacation. I bet the next group will be at my house all the time. Serves you right for being so warm and friendly, Ronnie said. Ah, the trash can is ringing, Herman said, nodding his head towards the trash can. Ah, mind your own business. It's some kind of rat, Ronnie smiled, and the two men shook hands again. Charlotte tried to open the front door with her key and found that the key did not fit. She took her phone out of her purse and tried to call the phone number for the gold standard real estate agency listed on the sign. She stared at it in disbelief. Her phone was fully charged, but apparently, there was something wrong with her phone. Darlene allowed Charlotte to use her cell phone while Gary walked around the house, checking the windows and doors. Charlotte muttered obscenities under her breath. When the call was answered, Gold Standard Real Estate, this is Melissa Sick, Melissa said cheerfully. Ah, yes, this is Charlotte Jackson, Charlotte snapped. I'm standing in front of my house, and my key doesn't work. Jackson? Ronald Jackson's ex-wife, Melissa said cheerfully. Wife? Wife? Charlotte snapped. Oh, I'm so glad to hear from you. I need you to sign some forms, Melissa said cheerfully. Oh, and you won't believe this, but I have a couple of clients. They are truly interested in your home. The house is not for sale, Charlotte shouted into the phone. Oh, so are you going to buy Mr. Jackson out? Melissa asked. I know the Richmonds will be very disappointed to hear this. Well, they also liked Pearl's house. Gary returned and reported that the house was tightly sealed. Charlotte again told Melissa that the house was not for sale. She then dialed Ronnie's cell phone number. Charlotte growled as Ronnie's voice announced that she had called Echo's renovations and remodeling. Come on, is there somewhere we can drop you off? Asked Gary, who was already bored with this drama. My cat, Charlotte remembered, squeezing herself into the car again. Yay, Dennis, answered Dennis. Dennis, it's me, Ronnie, said Charlotte. He gave Samson to you, asked Charlotte. What? Are you crazy? With poppy and olive oil and blue, here, they would tear that useless cat to pieces, Dennis snapped angrily. No, no, Dad has it, and you need to get him quickly. Dad's physical therapist is allergic to cats, Charlotte said, relieved. Oh, thank God, Charlotte sighed. And, ah, uh, thank you very much, Dennis continued, for the disappearance of Ronnie. Now, we are almost out of business. I got approved for federal savings and loans, but then I had to turn around and let Fronte take it because none of us know how to lay ceramic tile. Aha, uh -huh, said Charlotte and interrupted the conversation. Hey, how many people are you going to call? Darlene snapped as Charlotte began dialing her father's phone number. What? You have unlimited, right? Asked Charlotte. Oh, no, that's not true, Darlene said. 
I have a thousand minutes a month, and I know that Mr. Genius over there spent them all on his fantastic football nonsense. Last call, Charlotte promised. John ranted, raved, and hurled obscenities at his daughter. Reluctantly, however, he agreed so that she could come to his home. Gary drove to John Eccles' house and took Charlotte's suitcase out of the trunk. Darlene and Charlotte hugged, then Charlotte wheeled her suitcase towards the door. So, how is it? Gary asked Darlene as she climbed into the front seat of the car. God, what a disaster, Darlene sighed. I mean, look at her. Okay, do you think anyone would want to have intimate with her? Not when you're sitting next to her, Gary agreed as they watched Charlotte enter her father's house. But did you receive any money from her? Almost, Darlene sighed as Gary backed out of the long driveway. Ronnie! God, I hate this hole in my fifth place, can you hear me? He cancelled all her credit cards, and she had to use her debit card. But there are ATMs everywhere, Gary reminded her. Crap, got about ten bucks. We need gasoline. Yeah, there are ATMs everywhere, and she's on the internet. You can do that when your thick-headed hubby isn't wasting your minutes on fantasy football, Darlene snapped. Yes, here's 20. Yeah, that means she went online. What does this have to do with ATMs? Gary asked as he pulled into the gas station. She saw that Ronnie took half of her bill, Darlene said. Just get 10, okay? We still need to pay the electricity bill unless you've already paid for it, Gary nodded and walked into the attached convenience store. Darlene watched as Gary turned to the beer cooler and quickly grabbed a can. Gary frowned at her through the plate glass of the store window but turned back to the counter. I was just going to buy one can, Gary lied as he returned to the car. Yeah, one, Darlene snapped. When was the last time you received one can? Oh, hey, does that little work here now? Why does she have such big chest? Asked Gary. She has small chest, they just look bigger because she's so small. Darlene said. Come on, gas up. While Darlene and Gary bickered, Charlotte listened to her father's angry lecture. Since his stroke, John has used quite a lot of vulgarities in his conversation, and he didn't seem to mind using hateful, hurtful words to describe the people around him. I mean, seriously, when have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? Asked John. Fat pig, in that face, apparently, it caught fire, and they put it out with an ice pick. Dad, Charlotte gasped, truly hurt by his words. So, you're turning 40, big deal. Women turn 40 every damn day, John growled, but not every one of them turns into a stupid traitor just because she is 40, he pointed to the legal documents on the coffee table. Samson chose this moment to enter the living room. You need to hire a lawyer, and I need to clean that damn cat litter box, John snapped. Jesus Christ, I don't know what the hell that animal eats but damn it, it stinks. John turned sharply and pushed away. The left corner of his mouth was slightly open and he was drooling. You're in your old room, John snapped. Damn it, I hope it was worth it. Can you hear? I hope, damn it, it was worth it. Forty years and still a damn fool. That night, lying in her old bed and looking at the wallpaper she and her mother had chosen when she was eight, Charlotte sighed. Samson didn't move when Charlotte turned off the light and stared at the dark ceiling. The week marking her 40th birthday started off so promisingly. The plane ride was smooth and easy. Charlotte looked out the window as the glittering city of Las Vegas appeared below them. Excited, Charlotte and Darlene checked into their hotel room. They then rushed downstairs and spent a few dollars at the roulette table before deciding to have dinner. Charlotte was insulted when a handsome waiter told her that her credit card had been declined. The second credit card was also declined, and the manager brought the third card to the table with a hard look on his face. Charlotte took out her debit card and prayed that it would work. Luckily, this happened, and the manager brought her the card and her receipts. Returning to the room, Charlotte checked her bank account and found that it had been reduced by 50%. Both Charlotte and Darlene cursed Ronnie Jack Jackson. They both agreed that this man had gone too far, really too far. Come on, girl, Darlene encouraged. We're in Vegas. Vegas. We can't let this hole in our fifth place ruin our good time, right? 
but watching Darlene lose $300 at the blackjack table dampened the evening's celebratory mood a little. It was Charlotte's $300. Charlotte actually managed to pick up a handsome young man at a bar, 25-year-old David D. Tree. Went with Charlotte to her room for mine as all that happened. Charlotte then saw David trying to steal her wallet from her purse. Darlene complained that she was limited to $100 a day. Lady Luck and Darlene did not meet during this trip to Vegas. The $100 seemed to disappear from Darlene's hand the moment she left their hotel room. On Tuesday evening, the night of her birthday, Charlotte tried again to pick up a handsome young man. The young man grinned, then leaned closer. Charlotte leaned closer, giggling in anticipation. Lady, if I wanted intimate with some 300 pounds woman, I'd be home with my wife, he said. But um, I heard that there is a convention of the blind two hotels away from here. Why don't you try your luck there, you are fat. Suffering from the hurtful rejection, Charlotte took the elevator to their room. She groaned when she saw the do not disturb sign around the doorknob. Charlotte then went down to the coffee shop in the lobby and drank a cup of coffee for a couple of hours. Finally, Charlotte sent Darlene a message telling her she was coming back to the room. Returning to her room, Charlotte was relieved to see that the sign was gone and entered the room. After a hot shower, pulling pretty lingerie over her plump body, Charlotte lay in a large, comfortable hotel bed, staring at the ceiling. Then she realized that Ronnie hadn't called, her husband hadn't called to wish her a happy birthday. Tracy didn't call either, but the girl sent her a text message wishing her a happy birthday. A check of her cell phone actually made it clear to Charlotte that her husband hadn't even bothered to send her a text message. However, Charlotte smiled in response to Dennis, Brian, and Paul's birthday wishes. In the morning, Darlene complained bitterly about the budget Charlotte had limited them to. Darlene even indicated that she was the one who paid for the flight and hotel. By Saturday morning, Charlotte was seriously considering telling her cousin that it was all over between them, blood relatives or not. Charlotte had more than enough of Darlene's constant complaints. But Darlene had their airline tickets in her purse, so Charlotte remained silent. Now, lying in her old bed in her old room, Charlotte sighed heavily. Her big four-week wasn't much of a celebration. Jim Lees was the attorney recommended by Freddie Baxter. The Charlotte director of the Garland County Public Library, the man looked through the papers from Penny Barnes' office, then looked at his client and it sounded very harsh and dry. He gets half, you get half. The house must be sold, and any profits must be divided in half. Any expenses should also be divided in half. He's not asking for child support, even though he's essentially unemployed right now, Jim said. But I don't want a divorce, Charlotte whined. I don't want to lose my home. I don't want Mrs. Jackson. It really doesn't matter, Jim sighed. This is the terrible truth. One person out of two says he wants a divorce. Well, guess what? They may get divorced. Consultation? Asked Charlotte. Okay, we can request a consultation, Jim said, and Charlotte smiled. I'll call Penny's office. Charlotte listened to what Jim was saying. She studied the titles of the books in his bookcase as there seemed to be little more than aha and h from Jim. Okay, Mrs. Jackson. Here's the problem, Jim said, placing his cell phone on the table. I'm paying you so there won't be any problems, Charlotte said, clutching her purse tightly. Miss Barnes has no idea where her client is. Your husband came, paid her fee, and left, Jim said. All she has is an email address for him. Does she need it? This is the only way she can contact him, and no, she won't give us an email address. Attorney-client privilege. Oh. Charlotte whispered, sinking into a chair. And Ronnie told Miss Barnes that from now on, your daughter can pay for her own tuition and living in the dorm, Jim continued. Something about new traditions or something like that. Any idea what he means by this? No, Charlotte whispered, but I'm willing to bet Tracy knows. Charlotte did not celebrate her 41st birthday. She got dressed for another day of work and left her room. John didn't look up when his daughter kissed him on the cheek, he simply stared at his hands, clenched lifelessly in his lap. Do you need anything before I go to work? asked Charlotte. Nope, John muttered. Okay, then. I'll leave you and Samson. Behave yourself, 
okay? Said Charlotte, trying to put as much joy into her voice as possible. Everything is fine. My two best men will behave themselves, okay? What the hell do you think we're going to do? John spat, but it was mostly just grunts, squeaks, and barks. Charlotte went to work, the same route she had taken all last year, from her father's house to the library. She heard her cell phone ring but waited until she parked the car before looking at the display. Happy birthday, Charlotte, read on her mobile phone. Yes, Tracy, great, Charlotte muttered. Happy birthday to me. I'm so excited that I'm glowing with happiness. But she sent a reply thanking Tracy for the birthday wishes. Charlotte managed to lose 25 pounds in the year since her 40th birthday. However, no one noticed this. No one has paid her any attention since Ronnie left. Less than a week after Ronnie left, Charlotte realized Darlene and Gary's open marriage for what it was. Darlene and Gary had an open marriage because they didn't love each other, but neither of them had enough money to free themselves from the other. So, they lived as two roommates in a rented trailer rather than as husband and wife. There were no displays of affection between them. Darlene and Gary did not hug, they did not kiss. Charlotte remembered Ronnie hugging her and kissing her the night she made him pork chops, mashed potatoes, gravy, and green beans. Ronnie coming up to her, wanting a hug and a kiss. She pinched her nostrils. Ronnie smelled of sweat, of hard work, after her announcement that she was going to celebrate her 40th birthday in Las Vegas without him. Ronnie did not hug or kiss her again. The last time Charlotte saw Ronnie, she leaned in to kiss him, but he simply avoided her kiss. An hour after reading Tracy's text message, her phone rang again. Charlotte read a message from her manager asking her if she was late. Charlotte got out of the car in a daze and walked towards the back door of the cinder block building. Tracy read a text message from her mother thanking her for her birthday wishes. Tracy then looked at her cell phone. There was a photo of a little girl with a shock of brown hair looking back at her. Antoinette Barbara Jackson, 6 pounds 4 ounces, 17 and long, read a text message from her father's phone. Tracy actually found it rather ironic that her little sister and her mother shared the same birthday, but she didn't think her mother would find any humor in that little fact. Shannon Parr Becky McMahon, an attractive brunette, said into the phone, carpets, tiles, hardwoods, and laminate flooring. Hey, Shorty, the girl called, third line, excuse me, Ronnie Jackson said to a young couple who were trying to decide what color hardwood floors they would like for their home. Ronnie waved to Bobby East to help the young couple while he answered the phone. The young man nodded in agreement and approached the couple. Ronnie walked over to the wall phone and pressed the flashing extension. His gaze swept across the trading floor as he raised the phone to his ear. Ronnie was hoping to hear back from Samuel D., who was trying to get an exclusive contract to produce all the flooring for the developer's future projects. Shorty is listening, Ronnie said into the phone. Well, you know what, Mr. Shorty, his wife's voice was heard on the phone, looks like you and your seven and have put another one inside me. Shannon, are you serious? Ronnie asked, his mouth open in shock. I mean, really? Tony isn't even out of diapers yet, and I'm about to get another one, Shannon giggled happily into the phone. Where are you? Ronnie asked. I'm just leaving Dr. Pute's office, Shannon said. Well, you need to get that gorgeous fifth place of yours over here right now, Ronnie said. We're going to Stone Grill to celebrate. I think all this attention on my fifth place is why we got into this mess in the first place. Shannon giggled as she pushed Tony's stroller out of the Alliance Square Medical Center and into the brutal Texas sun. The four feet eight inches woman brushed her long hair out of her eyes, looking around. Always the shortest kid on the block, she learned to look around first before she walked. She looked at the scorching sun and smiled. When Ronnie stopped by the gas station to say goodbye to Shannon Carlisle and said he was leaving, she asked him where he was going. Ronnie looked at her for a long moment, then he shrugged. Why do you want to know this? He asked. So I can tell them where to send my last check, Shannon said, jumping off her milk crate. Are you going somewhere warm? I already have almost all the snow I can handle. Do you hear, Shannon? What does a gorgeous girl like you want from an old fart like me? Ronnie asked her. She was about to respond with her usual playful banter. 
Hmm. About seven in, when she looked up at him, she closed her eyes. What color are my eyes? She asked. Brown, real dark brown, Ronnie replied. I have a dimple, which cheek is it on? Shannon asked, opening her eyes. Left cheek. And when you smile, one of your teeth shows. The one on the right is a little crooked, Ronnie said. And why did you come to tell me bye, baby? Shannon asked, sliding out from behind the counter. Hey, Polly, I'm leaving, I don't know, Ronnie replied, as Polly, clumsily dragging his 312 pounds, walked out of the warehouse. Aha, uh -huh, Shannon grinned and grabbed Ronnie's left hand with her right hand. Polly, I'm leaving, but you still have two hours on your shift, Polly complained. Cough, cough, I feel sick, Shannon said. Bye, hey kid, have you ever been to Texas? Standing in front of the Alliance Square Medical Center, Shannon whispered, Hey Ronnie, I love you. What do you think of our story today? I don't think everyone is ready for an open relationship after many years together in a, a monogamous relationship. But what I liked about the story is that the man wasn't going to put up with his wife cheating on him and left right away. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. Until new videos.